<clears throat> Yo, welcome back. Welcome back to the Anti-Monopoly Happy Hour. I'm your host, Ron Knox, Senior Researcher at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, your friendly neighborhood monopoly crusher. It is uh, Thursday, June 10th, 2021. It is a pleasure uh, to have you here with us. It's a pleasure for me to be back with you, my friends. My friends. Huh? Speaking of friends, let's welcome back our co-host for the evening, your friend and mine, Tom Grassler. Tommy, what is, what is the happening? How's it going, Ron? Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I, uh, not, not too much, just, uh, just crushing Monopoly power. That's all that's going on here. That's what you've been doing? That's, yeah, every day. That's funny. That's what I've been doing, too. I can't believe we didn't run into each other. <laughs> it seems like we would have. Yeah, down at, uh, down at the old, uh, <laughs> the old, the old Monopoly. Monopoly plant. <laughs> I've, been doing, I've been doing overnights uh, ever <laughs> yeah, since. Uh, on that third shift. Ever since the shop shut down. So, that's right. Uh, that's right. That's right. Because of Monopoly power, right? <laughs> exactly. So you, so you switch shops. Um, all right. Lovely. It's so nice. Right, look, I'm just, uh, we're on episode number two, Dose. And um, it's very nice to be doing this. We've got news we're going to run through for you today. We've got, uh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put in a fresh piece of news right at the top of our new segment that's not on our, we have a little, we have a little run of show document. It's not on there, but um, major news happening in the world of uh, a potential anti-monopoly legislation, both on the federal level and at the New York level. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk wanting. What's up with that? Let's talk about that. And, uh, and of course, we have our very special guest uh, for the evening. Uh, she is an author, an all-around uh, anti-monopolist in the trenches, in the fight. Sally Hubbard from Open Markets Institute is going to be joining us a little bit later on. Let's get to the beer of the week. Beer of the week. What do we got? This, uh, it is, I'm going to, I'm going to point out, mm, it's Gemini season. Gemini season, everybody. So I got a little juicy gossip backwards there from Bell's. Well, I think Bell's, uh, and Tom, you can talk about it. You know Bell's uh, well. I think it's Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo. Uh, Comstock. Uh, Comstock. Oh, Did they sure. move it? Anyway. This is a, this was a, a trivia question I got wrong once. Oh, Maybe okay. that's the thing. Okay. Well, um, so from uh, uh, somewhere in our great uh, upper Midwest, and I think it's the best brewery in the country. That's my take on that. I mean, if you've got, you got Oberon, I'm putting my thumb right up to the camera. You got Oberon, you got Two Hearted, uh, you've got, uh, and then you got this one, and like all the seasonals they do, and all the big hop IPAs they do, I think it's the best one. It's the best one, and it is, of course, you love to see it. This little label, boo doo 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 Independent craft, and that little label guarantees that the beer you are drinking is made by a nice um, shop, small, locally scaled shop instead of some big tragic beer monopolist like Budweiser or Miller. So, cheers, Tom. You're out of. You don't have a beer this week, huh? Don't have a beer this week. I'm sorry, my friend. It's a sad story. Um, I will say that's a bold statement about bells. I'm just biting my biting my lip here. <laughs> no, it's a it's a hot take. I, it's, I, I, I I love I love some bells, but it's like maybe the best brewery of like 2011. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, they were right. great when you know. It's like I haven't had Oberon in years, and then I got really into dank IPAs, as all guys that look like me do. And uh, <laughs> once once I like became a beer guy, I realized that Oberon is actually like. Just kind of a solid middle. Um, it is a yeah, solid, kind of it, it is a solid middle. But anyway, we can talk about this more. Look, like Two Hearted is perennially one of the best beers in the country. Um, anyway, we can talk more about this. But Bell's is good. Uh, local, independent. It's not. It's not. It's it's local. Good distribution and independent. So get it wherever you buy your uh, your uh, your your hops pops at. My friend, what's up, Britt? Welcome to the chat. Thanks for joining us, the homie. Let's see the news. Uh, 
So, uh, so this is, I don't have any notes on this or anything. This is a little bit kind of impromptu and we don't know that much about it yet, but news broke today that, uh, uh, representative David Cicilline, who is the head of the house antitrust subcommittee and a good anti-monopolist himself, by the way, champion of this stuff. Um, and, uh, and others in the house are going to introduce five bills soon, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week. So at some point, they're going to drop five bills that were circulating, uh, among, uh, other house members, all of which are going to take on slices of America's monopoly problem in different ways. It's exciting stuff. The big one, I think, <clears throat> the big one to me, and I, and I get this off the top of my head, if I, if I mess something up here, forgive me. But the big one, sponsored by Representative Jayapal, is going to, supposedly, we'll see what happens, but the bill would restrict what big tech platforms are able to own if those other slices of their business compete with companies or users that rely on those platforms in order to reach the market, like the marketplace. Does that make sense? So tech- hit me with some hit me with some layman's terms. Some here, layman Ron. terms. Yeah, I'm trying to do layman's terms. So basically, if you own a platform, you cannot then compete on that platform against others that absolutely reliable customers. So this is we talked about. Um, we talked a little bit about what, Apple versus Spotify, right? So this is the idea that like Apple owns the um, owns the App Store, the iOS App Store. That's a platform. It's a depending on how you want to frame the market. It's a monopoly platform. I think it's a monopoly platform, and it uses that monopoly platform to promote some of its own its own products. So it has the Apple Arcade, it has Apple Music, it has some of these other things. And the iOS operating system is a platform in itself. It's, it, you know, certainly if the market is like iPhones, part of an obvious duopoly in mobile operating systems, okay. So it's a monopoly platform as well. Your phone comes equipped straight out of the box with Apple Music, and then you got to download Spotify, and when you do, Apple takes its cut. We've talked about this, talked about how this works. So the, so the suggestion, and we'll see what the language ends up looking like, because that's, you know, the devil is forever in the details. But the idea is that with this bill, uh, Apple or any other of the big tech platforms, and it sounds like it's going to be pretty specific just to, you know, to the big four platforms. The big four platforms, by the way, that were the subject of and target of the 15 month long House uh, antitrust subcommittee investigation that resulted in this big 450 page, really blockbuster report um, last year. So it's Amazon, Apple, Google, and Facebook. But those big four platforms, the digital platforms. If you own the platform, you cannot also compete on the platform with your users, whether they're small businesses or they're app developers or whatever it is that rely on those platforms to reach the market. But Ron, why would I ever develop a platform if I can't use it to compete against other people on my own terms? Uh -huh. wouldn't, this wouldn't this stifle the entire reason for going into business, which is to become a monopoly? <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate this. This is, this is, this is a swipe at, this is a swipe at like the capitalist model. And I, and I, yes. like, I can, I can appreciate, I appreciate it. I like, I know where you're going. I appreciate this. But what I'll say is that, uh, I assure you that owning the platform, owning the platform comes with its own monopoly, like issues for these companies, right? There's a lot. There's a lot that happens on these platforms that um, I and like many others believe is like anti-competitive. Literally done with the 
um, with the expressed uh, uh, intent, not expressed, with the intent, I'll just say intent, to um, exclude competition to like, to like to push others out of the market, get them out of business, uh, and so on. So the platform has its own problems, but the platform also for these companies has like, I mean, these platforms are, you know, um, like they're money makers. These are the most successful, <laughs> these are the most successful companies on earth. More but or what less if they could right be? Now. What if they could be slightly more successful? <laughs> that's not. You, you can't. That's. But that's. This is the thing. This is why we have laws. This is. This is. I mean, obviously, I'm speaking. Uh, I'm. 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 I'm using uh, a bit of irony here to make a point. Um, but I, I guess the to 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 move the ball a little further. What is the importance that it's been specifically the New York State Senate? And I think there's an important no, is, detail well, in here, well, right? Well, I'm talking, I, I want to get to the New York bill. I'm talking right now about the federal, like, you know, the federal bills that I have not seen. I have not laid eyes on. There are going to be five of them. This is the, this is at the federal, this is, these bills would, um, would amend and enhance the federal anti-monopoly laws to allow um, our enforcement agencies and the courts to refocus the courts. The courts have gotten, of course, as we know, the courts have gotten out of control. They don't actually um, enforce the laws as they're written or as Congress intended the laws to be enforced when they wrote them. So these, so this is kind of a, you know, like both a refocus of our of our core anti trust laws, and also an extension of these laws in order to deal with the outsize that has rapidly grown up in um, in the tech space. And we all know these companies, they're like constantly just part, they're like intrusive in our lives. And we're like, oh, I guess Google and Facebook are just going to follow me around the internet. And I guess I just have to, if I'm going to be on the web, I guess that just means that I am using AWS, whether I like it or not. And like all of these companies just have to pay um, Amazon for, for its like monopoly like infrastructure. But this bill which I would call, it's Jayapal bill that I'm talking about, which I would call probably a breakup bill. We're probably talking about separating out kind of pieces of the company, of the platform. And you reckon that, that's the, the, that this bill was written in a way explicitly to drive in that direction? <laughs> I don't know. Look, I don't know. I, haven't see, I, I have not seen it. Again, the devil will be in the details. But, what, but here's what I do know, is that the House subcommittee report, the antitrust report, after the 15 month big tech investigation its top line recommendation was structural separation you have these inherent conflicts of interest where the company that owns and creates and makes the rules for the playing field also plays the game you know what i mean and that it like it cannot happen and it's by its nature by its very nature anti-competitive because you have Amazon selling its own products on the Amazon marketplace with a documented history of favoring its own products while you have small businesses, independent businesses, and other sellers who are trying to compete with that. You can't compete with that. That's the point. You can't compete with that. They own the marketplace. So this is a bill. so. Does, does, so, so yeah. And this has the this has the potential for like to to radically reshape like our economy. Basically, if our economy is effectively these four monopolies, like more or less, our digital economy, um, it sounds like that this this bill could have a make a material difference in your day to day life. I hope so. For like a for hope, like a person hope, that is an I hope so. Person. I hope that's the that's the case. Again, just reports broke today that there are these five bills. They're circulating. We'll see them soon. And, but the language isn't final, which was made clear in the report. So that's, that's as much as I know. But let's hope it reshapes the economy because Lord knows the economy at the moment is not working for most people. It's not working for most independent businesses. It's not working in any way, whether it's that we're talking about like the economy, whether we're talking about our liberties, whether we're talking about our politics, it's not working. So let's hope that this kind of gets to that all right that's the news that's the that's the breaking news i want to talk real quickly about the new york bill 
and I'm gonna and I'm gonna start. It's nice to talk about the federal stuff first because it's a nice kind of lead in to um, to the state side, to what's happening in the states and in New York. And then there's this lawsuit in Ohio I want to talk about too. When we think of, I don't know, Tom, I don't know how you think about this or if you think about this, but when we, <laughs> the royal we, when I, and other anti-monopoly folks, I think, uh, think about the fight against um, extreme concentrations of corporate power, we think about this fight happening on like a national level. This is like a national issue. This is an issue for Congress. This is an issue for like federal law. And it's an issue for federal courts and so on. But that's not, that's actually not the case. That's not how we got here. How we got here, and by here I mean in um, a country that has really powerful, important laws on the books um, intended to restrain corporate power and corporate dominance uh, and lift up um, liberty and democracy. The reason we got here is because the states did it first. This whole thing started in the states. There were state anti-monopoly laws years before there was ever the Sherman Act, which is our big um, national antitrust law intended to address monopoly power. And it got, you know, I want to... <laughs> It's something Louis Brandeis said, right? That the states are these laboratories for democracy, these laboratories for policy. And Brandeis reading, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments. And that's what happened. And those state laws um, were successful and led to the passage of the very first um, anti-monopoly law on the federal level and so on, and it kind of cascaded from there. Because the states were bolder, they, they saw the issues that were faced by their residents. At the time, it was yeoman farmers and small merchants and workers. It, it still is today. So, so this, is, this is my question here, Ron, yeah. is that it makes a lot of sense if it's like, you can't pull all this coal out of West Virginia or all this oil out of Texas, but how can states manage something that's like, you know, the internet is everywhere. So right. you pass the law in New York, what's going on? It's not just like, all right, well, we'll, we'll rip up the rails and you can't get the pig iron out of Pittsburgh. You're, you're a smart cookie, Tom. You're a smart cookie. Um, yeah, well, let's. <laughs> so, what, so what happens uh, when you end up with like, you ever go to a, a website from England and there's like a big thing about cookies? Yeah, like, oh. cookies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because they have different, exactly. Because they have a whole different, they have a whole different regulatory regime over there, in, in you know, in Europe and England. So how can how can a state senate, which is like, you know, small potatoes, even a New York state senate, you know, it's like, it's a uh, how can how can uh like your local lo local yokels uh who like are often you know. Maniacs. I'm going to talk. No, they're not maniacs. No, no. I'm going to talk. Okay, look, look. Yes, yes, I get your question. It's a really good question, and I'm going to get there. Let me, I want to talk a little bit about what the legislation is because we haven't even really introduced it. Sure, right? sorry, sorry. No, yeah. it's my own fault. I'm like weaving, um, I'm weaving a sweater over here with all this thread. That's right. Um, <laughs> so here we are. At, uh, we're at this moment, just like the first, um, the first anti monopoly movement uh, in the late 19th century where we have extreme levels of industrial concentration. And in order to combat that, the New York State Senate this week has passed a law called the 21st Century Anti-Monopoly Act. And what this law will do is revamp the state's antitrust law and, and bestow upon law enforcers, both on the public side, the attorney general, and on the private side, regular Joes, plaintiffs like you and me, if we lived in New York, um, new powers beyond even what is offered by the federal anti-monopoly laws. Um, let me tell you what it does real quick. 
It creates a different standard for what monopoly power looks like. It's called abusive dominance. It's kind of a European idea. This is this is the that's the the term of art in Europe. Um, I saw them at Black Cat. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Abusive dominance. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They're uh, they're they're from Minneapolis. They're a little crusty for me, but no, no. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, but so it's a different standard, and with the, uh, you know, in, in this law, there are these really clear lines drawn about what companies are dominant, what companies aren't, what like what qualifies, um, and it has more. It has much more to do with uh, a company's behavior, whether it acts like a dominant company and it wields power like a dominant company, like, you know, a dominant company does, rather than what happens now, which is that you have these, like, long, drawn-out fights over, like, what the market is, what's, you know, what are we even talking about, what's the industry, um, and so on. And the hope is, is that this will take the power out of the hands of judges and the monopoly corporations and their corporate lawyers and their economists and so on and it will put the power back in the hands of the people the people of new york um to uh fight bad activities and bring some of these claims on their own now it also has so that's kind of like just the law enforcement side of it that's really important it also has really incredibly uh extensive New protections for workers. Um, it effectively will ban non-compete agreements and like no poach agreements. Um, which Love is- that, man. Huge issue in New York City and uh, fantastic. Like New York for a long time has been kind of uh, like your non-compete's no good here. Uh, you know, as somebody that works in media, I often get served with non-competes and I kind of, you know, laugh them away. Uh, and I think that anything that kind of put that into legislation that like, make someone not afraid to leave their job. Uh, that's objectively good. Like that's good for the economy. That's good for everything. Like we want people taking risks. We want people to feel like they can go out into the world without these like completely restrictive non-competes. Uh, and I just think that's wonderful. It is. But, like I love that. I love that that's rolled into anti-monopoly because in the end, that's what it is. It's that, like, you know, I've seen non-competes. It's like, you can never pick up a camera again. And like, you can't tell a teacher that they can never teach again. Uh, but media companies will absolutely say like, you can't cover your feet anymore. So you can't leave and don't even think about leaving. It's absolutely an, like an exercise of monopoly power. It's just, it just looks different. Most people think monopolies, they think of like, you know, sellers. They think of like, oh, you're the only company that sells um, like rolling pins. I talked about rolling pins. You're the only, only company that sells rolling standard pins. oil or something. Standard oil or yeah, exactly. You know, standard oil or you know, um, there are lots of lots of seller side monopolistic um, like powers in in America today. I mean, we have you know we have four airlines, three cell phone companies, one maker of eyeglasses, pretty much. You know, like all these kinds of things. So you have this. But another way that monopoly power is exercised is what they buy. Because you have really powerful buyers of things, including labor, right? And when you're a tight industry, that is, you have a lot of concentration in your industry, um, you wield a lot of power as an employer to set prices, you know, to dictate wages, to dictate your employees' you know, hours and their working conditions and whether they're spied on or not and all these kinds of things. And the beauty here is that under this bill, those kinds of uses and abuses of dominance um, would be enough to prove a case in court without having to worry necessarily about what the mar- what you know what the market is and end up in this like economist versus economist shit show fight um that like just lives within a courtroom and has it is completely detached from the idea of um you know the democratic enforcement of our laws so um so it's exciting stuff i don't want to go too much more into it um but it did but it passed this you know passed the state senate it still has to get through the assembly it's probably going to go through that process uh in the fall when uh, when the legislature is uh, is back in session, but really 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 exciting. Um, so good news, good news on the legislation front all over. 
We're going to make better laws. We're going to strengthen our laws. We're going to take the power out of the hands of judges and put it back in the hands of the people. That's the story. Let's get to some more news. Ohio. Some people say Ohio's in the Midwest. I tend to disagree. It really is. Doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. You no, know, I mean, your position doesn't make Oh, no. Sense. Ohio being in the Midwest doesn't make any sense. It's basically on the coast. Ah, more I mean, or less. Anything, anything west of Philadelphia is Midwest. Mm-hmm. Harrisburg is in the Midwest. <laughs> All right. Ohio. Uh, the Attorney General in Ohio this week sued Google for Google's abuse of its monopoly over its core search product, it's like search engine, by um, favoring its own products and services in its search results. Now look, this is an old accusation, right? I mean, this, is the, this, is the, this has been the main like crux of the um, abuse of monopoly power complaint against Google for like a decade more, more than a decade probably. This is a case that um, enforcers in Europe already brought against Google, find the company a bunch of billions of uh, euros, dollars, which of course Google cares literally nothing about. Water off the back. Plus a bunch of other enforcement agencies all over the world. I've already brought this case against Google and won. They were successful. So, okay. And the U.S. could have, by the way, the U.S. could have, the Federal Trade Commission, had this case in front of it truly a fastball down the middle of the plate during the Obama administration. And what did they do? Nothing. They didn't do anything. Shame on them. Oh, Barack Obama let let the opportunity for radical uh, liberal progress slip through his fingers? You don't say. Nah. Nah, I'm not going to blame it on Barry himself, but... Not not my Barack. Plenty more... Couldn't couldn't be him. Plenty plenty more I'm happy to put on Obama. Especially in the antitrust space. It was not uh, a good eight years for the most part. But, but, this is, this is on the Federal Trade Commission. They had it right in front of them. Didn't even swing at it. Left the bat on their shoulder. That's the, that's the problem that I have. So here we are, 2021. State of Ohio sues Google, makes the same, the same case. And I'm going to read from the complaint. I got it right up on the screen in front here. It says, Google intentionally structures its results page, that's its search results, to prioritize Google products over organic search results. Google intentionally disadvantages competitors by featuring Google products and services prominently on results pages. It often features Google products and services, for example, maps, um, flights, Google shopping. You see where that's going. Uh, in attractive formats at the top of the results page, above organic search results, additionally, Google often presents Google products in handsome ways. Blah, 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 blah. You get that. Okay. Got, a, got yeah. another question for you, Ron, here. All right, hit me. Uh, and that's like, how can one even prove what, or like, it's easy to say Google putting their own thing up over organic. But the is like, isn't organic search just whatever also Google, like the entire concept of organic search is still a function of Google crawling on things. I think that like people think that search engines are like some kind of like agnostic thing that exists in the ether. Like there is a true concept of search, but like all search is somebody ranking it. And it's Google gives weight to even what we call organic search is still Google weighting results. Like Google has its own algorithm. Yeah, yeah. That yes, absolutely. Weight. Absolutely. And I think that most folks, most like regular, regular Google search consumers, people who just have to use the dumb monopoly. By the way, the lawsuit's hilarious. The lawsuit's like, this is, there's no, we're not going to argue whether or not this is a monopoly. They have a 95% share of search. It's a monopoly yeah. any day of the week. Twice on Sundays. Okay, so anyway. No, but that Bing funny. exists. I thought, yeah, yeah, Bing exists. Yeah, right. Bing exists, and it's, but, you know, but, but you know, but again, this is, the, like, 
like a term of art that comes to mind is network effects. It's kind of like that, but this is like a data, you know, the Google search is a data monopoly. Every search that people do on Google gives it another piece of data about what search, what, what we, like what results people want. And then, and then Google search gets better and better and better. And then nobody uses anything else. Which is why I would argue there's no such thing as organic results. Okay, okay, but, like, okay, but fine. But, but like, okay, so my point is that I think most folks, most consumer folks are fine with that. They, are, they don't have any problem with that. They're like, they're okay with like, you know, Google deciding what's relevant and what's not relevant because they just feel, I think most people feel like, okay, Google, you know, Google in, in, in the organic sense is gonna give me, works. is gonna give me a good result. The problem, is when the result is inorganic. And that inorganic thing is Google promoting its own stuff ahead of what would naturally show up in the algorithm as the top result. So, and it happened, everybody knows this. Everybody who searches Google knows this. You search for, this is actually you search for Google's, a pair of shoes. You search for this like- This is Google's like actual product though, dude, because like, it's not just the, its own results. It's also all of Google advertising. It's like getting those top three in the SERP and like it says sponsored in like really tiny letters and everything. But, but Google is like talking about actual advertising. This business. is not talking about advertising. This is talking about like Google. When you search for a pair of shoes, the thing that appears at the top of the page or on the side of the page is Google shopping. Okay. Not if you like search for like Nike Airs or whatever, whatever, whatever. Then Nike, I'm making this up. I don't know what's going to turn up in the search results if you did this, but the premise is, is that Nike wouldn't be at the top. It would be like a Google shopping bar with a bunch of different Nikes on it that you click on and then you go to Google shopping instead of going to Nike. That I'm just I'm not, like I'm making it sure. up. But that's what the allegation is. And you know, and by the way, my, this, has my, been, this has been proven like a revelation. This is like what it is. It is what it is. All right. So the the novel, like the novel thing that's happening here is that rather than concocting some kind of conduct remedy where, where <laughs> you know... Where it's like, oh, it can only be bluegill shopping. <laughs> yeah, where you say... Which, like, you're saying, is that any better? I guess is the point that I'm making is that you can tell Google not to do it and then they'll just get kickbacks from whoever the person, whoever the agency is that they decide gets to be that. Because in the end, they will just get to decide. Google just gets to decide. Well, how like, or whatever they throw at the Well, top. that's right. I mean, yeah, that's right. And the problem is that is that then you're putting the onus on some enforce, some agents, some some someone from some government is 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 going to have to peer into Google's like notoriously opaque black box of its algorithm to make sure that it's not gaming the system to like to kick its own results a couple notches up the ladder or up to the top of the ladder. All Google has to say is, I don't know, we didn't do that. That's organic. I promise. That's just people just love us. People love all of our things. And so this is it. So nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody has time to do that. And if you find Google, Google reaches back into its uh, like Scrooge McDuck pit of gold Infinite, coins yeah. and Chuck and like Chuck's, you know, here, here take it. Who Fine as a price. Shit? You know, so anyway, so that's what's happening. But OK, but so the novel part of this lawsuit is that it says, no, 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 we don't want any of that. We're going to make you the phone company. We're going to make you a public utility. Love it. And with that designation, you are going to have non-discrimination rules put in place where you can't, you can't discriminate against anybody. You can't, you just... Your, whatever the organic thing is, that's what it is. You can't put anything up at the top because you have to give everybody equal access to your essential infrastructure. It's saying that it's so it's a fascinating lawsuit and it's ba it's so funny because it's because it's based on it's not based on, but it <laughs> makes a point to highlight um, a concurring statement from Justice Clarence Thomas on the U.S. Supreme Court, who is, I think, any, I think, I think most folks would say who is, who is the most conservative justice on the court by a mile. But in a case last year that was the Trump versus Twitter case, if you recall, in ancient times, a year ago, um, this case made it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, 
it's over. It doesn't matter. Who cares? Trump's not on Twitter anymore. It's not, it's not our business. But Clarence Thomas wrote this other, this other, um, this other uh, you know, opinion and said, in this opinion, I think that these powerful websites, these powerful platform sites should be considered infrastructure. They should be the same as the railroad tracks, the roads, the phone lines running from the pole to your house. That's what they are. And we should be, able to, regu- and we should be able to regulate them. Rare that I agree with our old pal CT. Right, and it, right, exactly. And, and you know, Lena Khan, uh, who is Joe Bless Biden's up. nominee. <laughs> What's up, Lena? Lena Khan, what's happening? Uh, who's Joe Biden's nominee to join the Federal Trade Commission. Um, and she is poised to become the most important uh, American trust buster since the New Deal. She was asked about this during her confirmation hearing, and she said, ah, you know, actually, these, uh, you know, these non-discrimination rules around um, essential infrastructure are part of the, the tool bag when you're trying to fight monopoly power. It's all part of it. And so the Ohio AG, a Republican, by the way, not that it matters, but he's a Republican, he quotes in the lawsuit Clarence Thomas saying, you know, these companies are basically the phone company nowadays. What are you going to do without Google? What are you going to do for your job if you have any kind of like office-based information service type job? What are you going to do without Google? Nothing. You know, you're going to be up a creek. So if that's the case, you got to make Google um, a fair an open platform for anybody risk of discrimination without risk of Google putting its own search results up at the top just so uh, it, it it gets a few more eyes, makes a little more money and can sell some more ads. So that is the thing. It's a fascinating lawsuit. Who knows where it will go? But that's where we're at. That's where we're at in America. We're at America where in two states, one very democratic, New York, one with Republican leadership in Ohio, are both taking on the fight against monopoly power from different angles in different ways. Um, but it's all part of this grab bag. And it's all due to this broad realization across this massive spectrum of um, political ideology that we've got a problem with corporate power in America today. And we've got to take it on. Got to take it on. Tommy? Over under. How many, how many years before uh, Google's public utility? Hmm. I don't know. I'm not going to bet on that. I'm not going to bet on that. I love the idea, though. I love the idea, though, until Google is a public utility. What's the sports book say? Let's, what, do, what do the DraftKings say? Hey, will they take my... Will I they, can't even... I can't will even they give me 10,000 to 1 on that? I can't even wrap my mind around it. I really honestly can't. I cannot even wrap my mind around it. Yeah. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see. I don't know that that's going to be the tool. The thing is, the reason, you know, my hesitation is because I don't know that that's going to be the tool that gets the job done. I think it's going to be a, I think it's going to be a grab bag of things. I think it's going to be, I think it has to be, it has to be a whole suite of new tools. There's got to be structural separation. I, th- I think there does. There it really does. It's easy to think about that with a company like Amazon. It's a little and 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 Facebook. You see what's happening right now. Facebook getting sued by the FTC, trying to spin off Instagram and WhatsApp. With Google and Apple, it's maybe a little trickier. And then I think you add in some non-discrimination. Then I think you ban mergers and unwind some bad mergers. And I think you do all these things, and at the end of the day, you get to a place where you're in a better position. We got to get to Sally. I'm going to do story time real quickly. We're going to go a little long on this one. I want to get the story time real quickly because it's such a, it's such a good story. Not good. It's such an interesting story that I want to touch on real quickly. Let's do story time. Story time. time story time. Stories. Story time. Chumps. All right. The gist of this story. Let's get it up on the, let's get it up on the big screen. Let's get it up on the big screen. Here it is. 
it's such a big story that the New York Times did this freaking animation for it. That, that's like, how you know it's real. That's how you know it's real. That's how you know the Times is like, this is a dope story. We're dropping this. We're dropping this spicy story on the public. They can't take it. We're going to do an animation. All right. So the gist of the story is that um, all of these services that mill- millennials, literally any, all that means is anybody, but like millennials have gotten so accustomed to all our ride share, which is an awful term, ride share apps, Ubers and Lyfts, all of our delivery apps, our Grubhubs and DoorDash, our bird scooters, whatever the case might be, all these things that we've gotten used to paying these kind of nominal prices for, suddenly these prices have skyrocketed over the last few months, really, but maybe longer yeah, since I'd say since uh, the beginning of Joe Biden's presidency, now that you put it together. <laughs> Stop. I'll tell you, <clears throat> the, uh, all the delivery apps went through the roof all during the pandemic. The ride share ones, I think, have this is a recent phenomenon. But anyway, all of a sudden, they put their prices up to what I think most people would logically expect them to be in the first place. The problem is that uh, is that people have gotten used to paying these like micro fees, basically, for these ostensibly very expensive services, and now the hammer's coming down. And we're upset about it. People are upset. So let's, about let's put let's put this in real cash terms. Like, hold on, hold on a second, hold on a second, hold on, hold on. I'm gonna get there. Oh yeah, let's. That, 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 that's a good point. That's a, a good point. An, anecdotal. Uh, I'd say Lower East Side to Bed Stuy in an Uber, twenty two dollars on a uh, Wednesday evening at nine p.m. That's what now was... that same trip is sixty dollars. There we go. Okay. Today. Yep. yep. Today that trip will be sixty dollars today. And uh, the cab, the entire time, a cab has been like $52. Yep, absolutely. So like, you know, you're like, why would I ever take a cab when someone can come to right here and, and I don't have to pay cash and I, mean, I can be there for 20 bucks yep. and now it costs $60. It's three times more expensive. It's like, well, it's a, no, that's actually the cost. And this entire time you've been paying artificially low prices. Yep. Yep, exactly. So I'm going to read, I'm going to read what I think is the crucial paragraph from the story. These companies, investors, and they're talking about Uber, Lyft, and so on. These companies, investors, didn't set out to bankroll our decadence. They were just trying to, to get traction for their startups, all of which needed to attract customers quickly to establish a dominant market position, elbow out competitors, and justify their soaring valuations. So they flooded these companies with cash, which often got passed on to users in the form of artificially low prices and generous incentives. Okay, there you go. So that's the so that, that's what happened, and we all knew it. But there have been a million stories about this, like like Uber, like Uber's Wall Street bankroll that has kept it afloat all these years. This is just a monopoly play, and we've talked about this before. This is a hundred percent monopoly play, both with other ride sharing apps and with of course its primary competition, which are medallion taxis in cities across the country. All right. So look, in one way the story is probably fair. In one way the story is saying, like, you chumps shouldn't have been why did you think these prices were fair in the first place? Are you yeah, are you the, insane? The, <laughs> did you you know, I see, I've seen the framing once as like it's like middle class people pretending they're upper class. Like it's not really kosher to have a driver or a house cleaner or any of these things like servants. Like people just want servants. And in the United States, like we have these wage floors. So like servants cost a bunch of money. And they're also like, you know, people feel icky about them but I'm totally good with like someone bringing food to me and I'm totally good with someone driving me around because like culturally it doesn't feel like servants. It's the gig economy. It's a total, it's a, it's a, it's a but it's like that money was coming from somewhere. Mm-hmm. Like some, there was something artificially lowering. It wasn't just all of a sudden like cheap to free to hire labor. Like yeah. the cost of labor is like a, is a, is a real cost. It's just that that money was burn rate 
until they could become a monopoly. Exactly. I mean, exactly. And, you know, but it's, well, okay. So, yes. So I get that. I'm like, okay, that's a little bit valid. Maybe everybody should have been highly suspicious of this low price that we're paying for these services. And, but we all knew this stuff. We knew this stuff. Look, so that's why I have, I have two problems with this. I'm going to go through them real quickly. And then, and then, and then we're going to talk to Sally. First, the first thing is that we consumers have been taught forever that price is deals king. a deal. A deal is a deal. A deal. Price is king. Hey, the money talks. If you and don't take it, you're a chump. You're, a chump. you're an idiot. We gotta do take. We gotta do take an eighty dollar cab when it's a thirty dollar Uber. You know, and we and we're, and we're taught to worship these like tiny prices, no matter the cost, right? That's and and that's not just millennials like searching for a cheap um like taxi around town uh that's walmart shoppers bro that's that's amazon shoppers we're to just forget just we're supposed to have tunnel vision forget all the other stuff and just worry about that low price this is like this is what the consumer welfare standard is all about these are the the the, the brain worms that we've been infected with and it's not like millennials didn't infect themselves. We have been infected by this, this low price lie by policymakers. Well, there's for only a one generation. Thing can, there's only one thing that contributes to your welfare, and that's the lowest possible price. It can't possibly be <laughs> consumer consumer welfare can't be ma- can't be measured by like did this destroy our communities? Hmm. Like that's not welfare. No. Like it's not, it's not, it break, did it break families? uh, And, and has it completely like rippled through like all sectors of employment? That's not welfare. It's me happy and well, it's a low price. Not a job, not a local store where, where your neighbor works and owns and hires your kid for a decent wage or whatever. The second thing is that the, like the article, although it hit that you know, paragraph that I read was important because it really did talk about this quest for like for dominance. And that's all it's been. All this money ploy has just been a quest for dominance. OK. But it doesn't quite get at, at like the how it happened, like the market share by any means um, strategy and how uh, our regulatory authorities they're supposed to protect um markets supposed to you know protect competition protect us from monopoly power and these monopoly abuses they were just gone they were just gone they didn't do anything so you have all these mergers happening right you have uber postmates you have grubhub just eat we, you know we sat and watched while yellow cab in san francisco went into bankruptcy you have this like entrenched taxi cab crisis in New York City where all these drivers are in hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt to their medallions. This debt that you used to be able to pay off pretty quickly because because driving a cab used to be a middle class job. Ladder ladder to the middle class. Now exactly. And now it's not. Now you're just now it's just a now it's a debt game. Now you're just like, how much debt can I possibly take on um, in exchange for this medallion? and to starve out in the streets. You have ride, you have like taxi cab rides in LA down 42%, you know? And these are all wrought by these low prices. In so many ways, our, um, our policymakers and regulatory agencies are responsible for this. And now we're just supposed to deal with it. Now you're like, oh, well, pay up, buddy. This is, I'm gonna crack open this that is- wallet. You know, this is a similar a similar approach, and I promise I won't harp on it. But but you'd you'd rightfully called this out when I when I first stumbled upon this article is that it pushes the it pushes the impetus onto the consumer. Like why aren't like suck it up, buddy? Now you now you got to pay the piper, or deal with it. Where it's actually a regulatory process, and it's a failure of regulation. The same way that like if only you recycled more, you know there wouldn't be global warming. Yeah. Like switch to paper straws. Like this is the paper straw argument where it's like no, we have to stop. The, like the entire airline and cruise industry. We cannot like, solve sh- this. We, have to sh- we can't spend it- our way out of this. It doesn't matter what. It, it's over now. It's over. you let it happen, and now we and now you now you're just like oh well, pay up, buddy. Tough shit. Yo, Tracy McGravy, thirty thirty. Thanks for the follow. What's up? 
All right. Let's get to our guest of honor this week. She is the director of enforcement strategy at the Open Markets Institute. Our brothers in arms, what's up? She's the author of Monopolies Suck. Oop, doop, doop, doop. Oh, let's, I'm gonna switch my chat. There we go. The author of Monopoly Suck, Seven Ways Big Corporations Rule Your Life and How to Take Back Control. Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome Sally Hubbard. Sally, what's up? Not much. Thanks for having me, Ron. I've been enjoying your conversation. You're speaking my language. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. I'm, hey, you're... I'm sure you were chomping at the bit to like uh, probably correct some moronic thing I said about something. <laughs> All right. Look, um, I want to get to the New York law because I know you've been really hands on with that law, advocating for it um, and, uh, and doing a lot of work for it. But first, I want to talk about your book a little bit. OK, look, your, your book is called Monopoly Suck. Like, that's pretty mean. Why are you so mean to monopolies? Sally, tell me about that. You know, what you guys were just talking about was so much the driving force behind why I wrote this book was I wanted the people to understand all the ways that monopolies screw them over on a daily basis that is not just about price. I do have the first way that corporations, big corporations, you know, rule your life is the way that they gouge you on prices. That's chapter one. But then they also, you know, screw you over when you're a patient and you're, the reason that you're getting gouged with healthcare costs, that's because of a lot of monopoly problems with big pharma, big hospitals. You know, when you're finding that your wages just don't ever go up and you don't see a path to entrepreneurship or to, you know, the American dream, like monopolies are behind that as well. They're kind of just the root of so many problems or when you're worried about you know, our democracy falling apart. They're playing a huge role in that as well. So I wanted to take kind of this ivory tower topic of antitrust and make it accessible to people so they understand why should I care about this? Why does it matter for me? And to show that it's not an individual problem. It's not something that you're doing wrong as a per individual. It's, it's not something you can fix as a consumer. It's, like, you know, a big structural thing that's really just, you know, Feeding everybody and making life harder on a daily basis. So that was that was why I wanted to write the book, make it really. So I used Monopoly Sucks so that people would understand very clearly what I was trying to explain. Well, it was impossible to spot the lie in that title. It was exactly correct. And I think I read the book. It was, a, it was like a wonderful book. And, you know, as you know, I mean, yeah. this is kind of my language too, right? It's like, how do you make this stuff accessible? How do you make people kind of understand and open their eyes to like all of this outsized corporate power all around them that dominates their lives in so many different ways. Maybe people don't think about it, they don't recognize, but once you show it to them, it's instinctual. Once you show it to them, they're like, oh, ah, you're right. Look at all, look at, you know, you're right. I do only have, like, I didn't know this one corporation owned these like eight different brands of like potato chips that I like walked down yeah. the aisle of my, of my grocery store. And I see, and I thought there was all this incredible robust choice. Like we're supposed to have in a capitalist society. And instead it's like, I get three choices in reality. I get three choices because they're all, it's an illusion, all, right? It's an, an illusion. illusion of choice. Exactly. You know, beer, especially, I appreciate that you have the beer, uh, the independent beer, because that's one of those illusions where we have, I think the big guys have something like 500 brands. Something insane like that. <laughs> they, I don't know if they have that many, but they have a lot. And I've written. They a lot do. Of, no, written, seriously. Because they buy, they've been buying up all the indies. They've been buying up all the indies. They control distribution. So you walk down yeah. your, your your beer aisle in the supermarket and you're like, oh, I've got, I can get the, I can get like the barley pops. I can get the Budweiser and whatever, or I can get this great IPA or this great session or whatever it is. It's all owned by the same company. So yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Losing the choice. And once you open people's eyes up to it, it's like, it's 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 as clear as a bell, in, in, but also in, ingrained the, in our nature, right? The point that you guys are making that you know is not just about being a consumer, right? Like you're not any better off if you pay lower prices, but you're making less money, right? Like say something costs five dollars less, but you're making five thousand dollars less, you're worse off, right? Right. So like it doesn't make any sense to focus on only the consumer side, and then the reality is this whole 
function focus on this consumer welfare standard was a huge lie anyway we still got the high prices right we still got all the price fixing and all the high prices so we still got the high prices but we also got screwed in every other way um and really like i've just this is something that i've been thinking a lot about lately is just how when you focus on first and foremost you make people believe that they're primarily a consumer and not a citizen, not a creator, not a producer. It's incredibly disempowering. It's really a way of taking away their power. That's right. And You're so, not that powerful as a consumer. That's right. That's right. You're just, it, I mean, look at consumers, a one-way street. You're just like a shopping robot. This, I'm just going, I'm just buy, I pay my phone bill and I go to the store and this is all I'm supposed to be doing. Right. But once you, well, once you get out of that silo of being a consumer and you look at the rest of what is supposed to be this robust and satisfying life, that we're supposed to be leading, <laughs> right? It's supposed to be yeah. good. We're in America. Yeah. This America. We're supposed right. to be pretty good. And you say, ah, oh, I can't. I wish I could start a business, but my business has to be Amazon proof. And I wish mm -hmm. I could like really be a better judge of the news, but I'm just getting these like news feeds blasted in my eyeballs, and I don't know what's true and what's not true. All of a sudden, you're like, exactly. Boy, it's not very good. It's not very good. Exactly. And I think people just don't out. realize how much monopoly power relates to so many things. Like we all know our healthcare system is a mess. We know that there's these big corporations, but we don't know how much there's really like straight up anti-competitive conduct that's causing us, you know, billions of dollars a year. Yeah. And, you know, with the tech platforms, particularly people have this illusion that they're good for them in some way. Like Google's good for me, Amazon is good for me. And so I really wanted to pierce through that illusion in my book and explain um, that, yeah, there's some benefits to these corporations. I'm not saying they're not offering anything of value, but that doesn't mean that they can just rampantly violate every law that's designed to make sure that we have an economy that works for everyone where the best can work. Um, you know, so it's not an either or thing like you, you, you know, that they have to, that if you're saying you have to follow the law, then that means they can't offer anything of value. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, it's a wonderful book. People should go pick it up. They should read it. It, it. I think it cuts to the quick when you're talking about America's monopoly problem, how we got here and how we can solve it. So um, it's a wonderful book. Thank you very much for writing it. Look, I want to play a clip uh, of you testifying in September before the New York State Senate in favor of the 21st Century Anti-Monopoly Act, this piece of New York state legislation that we talked about earlier. Um, I want to play the clip. Here it is. I believe the tech giants are each violating the federal antitrust laws as those laws are currently written. And as you know, the New York AG has the power to enforce those laws. But the courts have spent decades nearly gutting them and paving the way for concentrated corporate power to take over America. Big tech's enduring dominance is fueled by monopolization that violates Sherman Act Section 2. But because of court decisions, Section 2 cases take too long and cost too much money. Anyone seeking to claim their right to a competitive marketplace must spend huge sum of, sums of money to hire economic experts. Monopolist victims can rarely afford to sue them, and the enormous expense also affects enforcers' calculus of whether or not to bring cases. New Yorkers deserve an abuse of dominance standard that makes a clean break from Section 2 legal precedent. New Yorkers need a new tool to fight monopoly. All right, there it is. There's the clip. Look, that's the argument. So there it is. There's your core argument, right? Federal law is broken. It's a good law, but it doesn't work because of all the reasons that you explained. New Yorkers need a new law with which to fight monopolies. Explain a little bit. I talked a little bit about it earlier, but you've been so hands-on. You've been, you know, you testified before the state Senate. You've been hands-on throughout the process. Tell me how this law is going to give the power back to consumers, to independent businesses, um, and to the public uh, in New York State if and when, I'll say if and when, it becomes law. Well, um, you know, because it's so difficult to win in these cases under the way that judges have, you know, completely screwed up uh, the federal statutes. This new law uh, from New York 
is going to create an entirely new standard that's not tethered to those bad cases that says, look, if you're a dominant corporation, you can't abuse that dominance and skew competition. So that alone, that standard is a really big deal. Also, the stuff you were talking about earlier about really having labor be an important part of it and looking at the power of a, of a buyer, um, you know, they call it monopsony instead of monopoly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, that's buyer power. That, is, that, that can actually, you know, have tremendous impact on, on entrepreneurs, on workers. Um, so to factor that into the law is a really huge deal. Um, there's a lot of other, you know, good provisions in there. Um, and even though this is just New York, Tom was mentioned this earlier, like how can New York do this if these are, you know, if this law can be used against corporations that are global. And, you know, the reality is the system of our U.S. government is a federalist system. This is federalism. Every state has their own laws, their own right to protect their citizens, right? Um, and New York has the right to protect their citizens. It's the federal government doing it. Um, and, you know, these companies make billions of dollars off of New Yorkers, right? <laughs> uh, and, you know, the New York State New York State Legislature and the New York State Attorney General, where I used to work, uh, have the right to enforce the laws, uh, uh, the state laws, on behalf of their people, right? I mean, that's why we have a federal system of government. We yep. didn't just create a federal government. We created two layers of government yep. to make sure um, that we have this, la- you know, this is another form of laboratory where you can see what I think is so cool, and you are talking about this earlier, is all the different approaches that different, different governments are taking, you know, around the world with Europe, you know, Ohio, you're talking about, um, New York. That creates this laboratory where, you know, these are hard problems, but something is going to either be the most effective or just the combination of it all will be, you know, like I say, death by a thousand cuts basically. Um, But we can see this experimentation about what is effective and what's not effective. Um, And, you know, it's just a wonderful time that there's just widespread recognition that it's a problem. Cause I spent the last six years being like, there's a problem, there's a problem. And for me, it's like, whew, yeah, people finally see the problem. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think I think hey, I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, you look at you look at the bipartisan support, and look, I mean, I'm just gonna say I, you don't have to say anything, Sal, if you don't want to. But I'm just gonna say, it. I think there are people who are bad actors who get involved in this stuff because it fits a narrative, it fits what they're trying to do, whatever. I think we can, I think we can, I think we're, we're all logical people. I think we all have good in our hearts and we can like cut some of these bad actors out. Okay. Let's just say that. Let's just say that. But what's even what's left, even after you do that, what's left is this real consensus from, from both parties and from people, regular Joe's on the street. You look at the polling and people are like, yeah. Like people by a big margin of all of all political persuasions say this is an issue. We don't feel like we have the liberties that we were promised because we have these big corporations that steer our lives, that control what we want to do, that cut off our avenues to to success. And it's a big and it's a big issue. And they cut off our, you know, our our access to information. Um there's a speech issue in there too, you know? Right. And I think you wrap all that up and we're really, uh, you know, again, we're at this moment. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Let me ask you this on the same topic. What's your hope? What's your, what's your pie in the sky vision for what this federal legislation, both these bills that are, that are talked about and we'll probably see at some point soon on the house side. And then what's already been introduced um, on the Senate side. You kind of you combine all of this, what you've seen and what you've heard. What's your what's your hope for what for what it might be able to do for the economy? You know, since I'm a former antitrust enforcer, the way I look at all this stuff is kind of like, would these changes to the law make it easier for me to bring a case against these these monopolies? And I think they would. The, you know, the what I've they're not nothing I've seen. The ideas that I've been heard, heard tossed around are perfect. They're not perfect. <laughs> you know, they're not the pure version of anti-monopoly that uh, purists like you and I would love to see. 
But I do think anything that makes it easier for antitrust enforcers and private lawyers, you know, like we see the Apple v, uh, the Epic v. Apple case right now, private, private um, companies and attorneys bringing cases. Anything that makes it easier for them to win in court, I think will have a huge impact, both on getting the kinds of remedies we need to break up these corporations or to uh, stop their anti-competitive practices, um, and to start to create a bit of a chilling effect for them. Because they've had no cop on the beat, right? You know, just rampantly violating the antitrust laws for, you know, years, you know, almost a decade now. Uh, depending on the company. <laughs> um, and because they know there's been no consequences, right? And like you said, a fine is not a consequence, you know, but actually uh, major changes that require them to change their business models, change their, you know, MOs of basically not competing to be the best, but just muscling people out. You know, they're past the point where they're like, we're competing based on are we offering a better service or product? They're just using the muscle and taking it from one market to the next, to the next, to the next, right? So that no one else has a shot. And then they're also just extracting wealth from everyone that they touch because everybody has to do business with them and has no choice to accept their terms. Yep. So it's like this huge vacuum extracting wealth from every sector of the economy, from workers, from small businesses, from creators, you know, and then having this tremendous political influence because of their economic power, which is where our democracy harms come in, in addition to the control of speech. So. Um, you know, I want to see, uh, I think it's going to take a lot of time, but every bit of progress is just a step in the right direction. And I think we've done it before in American history. We had the original Gilded Age, age. we defeated the robber barons. It wasn't a clean, quick process, but it did happen. We had a time of prosperity and a, and a broad middle class from, you know, the, what, the 40s through the 80s. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you exactly. know, that was really, so we did it before and we can do it again. Um, and so that's my hope that we can have a, a deconcentrated economy with widespread opportunity and deconcentrated control over speech. So we can have, uh, you know, a, a, a truly functioning marketplace of ideas and a public sphere of debate. Um, I think we will get there. I think it's going to take time. It's not going to be an easy process, but we've turned a major corner of major corner. Absolutely. Yo, I couldn't agree more. You got me pumped up. Let's go. <laughs> Sally Hubbard, you're a comrade. You're, uh, you're a force to be reckoned with. You're, you're, uh, you're uh, and just an incredible partner to be in this fight with. I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much for joining us, talking to us about your book, talking to us about all this incredible legislation that's coming up. Let's do it again soon, all right? Thank you for having me, Ron. No worries. Have my, a good night. My pleasure. You too. All right, friends. Thank you very much. That's it. It's been another happy hour with us. I'm honored to uh, have hung out with you all. Thank you very much, Tommy, my man. Thank you very much for co-hosting. Um, find us online. If you're watching this at some other time other than the happy hour, you can always catch us live Thursday nights. 7 Eastern, 6 Central, twitch.tv slash ronnoxilsr. Come there, hang out, chat in the chat. It'll be amazing. You find us on Twitter, Anti-Monopoly, HH, the HH stands for happy hour. Next week, we'll be on with the homie, the big homie, Leah Dylan, reporter at Politico, antitrust veteran. She's been covering it forever. She'll talk to us about her job and what she sees the anti-monopoly landscape until then my friends stay strong fight the power do not let our corporate corporate overlords get you down all right we'll catch you next week